Hi, welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out the new eyewear and the brand new helmet from Pock, and it's a serious looker. Saracen go massive in length in bikes and also direct, which is kind of interesting. And we check out some cool retro Cannondale stuff. Okay, so let's jump into the show. And what I want to talk about this week is brands. Now, not in relation to bikes, but in components. Now, when you buy a bike off the shelf, quite often you might find, oh, I don't like those handlebar grips, or I don't like the saddle, I wanna swap those things out, or perhaps the handlebars. When you do that, what is it that makes you wanna swap that out? Uh, this is just a bit of market research from my own point of view here, because more and more brands are including components on their bikes by their own in-house design, and that stuff's really good. Like Canyon, on my bike I've got a really nice set of bars, G5 bars, and a stem on there, and they're, they're the measurements I like, they look really cool, I'm never going to change them. There's no need, and you know, unless I break them, whatever. There's, there's just absolutely no need. And the same can be said of Noop if they're really like really up to speed on this. But some brands, obviously, um, they'll give you a great bike and it'll give you just a no-name handlebar or stem or something like that, and it might not be the width or the rise that you want. So you're going to upgrade, right? Now, when you do that, would you pick an independent brand like Rental we use here in this case, or would you go for something in the rise you feel? at a cheaper price that's a no-name no brand that might offer you exactly what you want that you could get from Renthal, but at a cheaper price. Um, this isn't just a price thing, like are you interested in buying into the brand? Or are you just not fussed, you just want the product that works and hit the trail? Um, I guess the same could be said on a more expensive level with things like Fox Kashima Coating versus their Performance Black. Would you pay the extra to have the Kashima Coating? Or do you not care? You just want the fork that works, that gives you the damping that you're looking for, uh, and the travel that you want and stuff. Um, just really interested. I think it's pretty topical because a lot of people at work have been arguing about this. And the biggest argument actually seems to come up that there's a couple, oh, there's a lot of different types of mountain biker out there. There's a type of mountain biker that wants to just ride, they're not that fussed about a kit as long as it works, and they'll spend the money on what they need to. And there's another type of mountain biker that really loves spending the money on on their bike stuff, it's their passion, it's their thing that they love. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of got a little bit of me in both camps there, uh, probably probably less so on the picking stuff these days, and more so on just the wanting to ride it, but I've definitely been both over the years, so uh, yeah, where do you sit on that one? Okay, so straight into news, I want to show you the new POC helmet. Oh, look at that bad boy. Is an added beast. So this is the Cortal Race Mips. Uh, there is a non-Mips version. We'll get to that a bit later in the video. So it's designed for all mountain, enduro, basically big mountain, aggressive riding where you need more protection, and you're gonna be riding in more demanding conditions. Uh, forgive me if there's some dirt smudges. I have actually used this helmet a few times. I've tried to clean it up as best I can. So, what do you need to know about it? Loads of massive vents or ports on the back for pulling the air out. Uh, the upper vents or ports of which you can slide your eyewear in. They call this an eyewear garage. Basically, you can make glasses on the back when you're climbing or anytime you just don't want to be wearing them. Now, obviously, this thing has just got huge vents all over it, much bigger than we've seen before on POC off-road helmets. And at the front, it's got these big channels here just above your eyebrows to really pull the air in and just to cool you off as you ride. Now the peak design is quite different from previous helmets in the fact that it doesn't have metallic hardware or anything. It is adjustable, you can move it up three position there, but it's a breakaway peak. So it's designed to pop off in the event of a crash. So this will not sacrifice anything in the way of safety, uh, which is a good job because it's quite a big peak as well. Uh, great for when you're going through the undergrowth to you know stop getting whipped in the face. Good for keeping sun and rain and stuff out of your face. And of course you can move it up and out the harm's way in order to fit a pair of goggles on there if that's, if that's your thing for enduro riding. Speaking of which, goggle strap would sit across the back here so it's not interfering with any of the vents as well, which is really cool. Now it passes all of the usual safety standards, but interestingly, it, it exceeds another one, a Dutch standard called the NTA 8776, which I hadn't heard of, I had to look into. Uh, and essentially it's still for bicycle transport, but higher speed stuff. Uh, so you could say it'd be great for enduro races because of that sort of basis, although they, they would a lot of the time be wearing a full face helmet. Um, and also really good for things like e-bikes because of the higher overall speed that you can get to on those things. So the construction of the helmet is an EPS liner, as you imagine, on the inside, and it has this unibody construction, as we've seen with Aramid running through it, basically to keep it all in one piece. Uh, structurally, a very sound and strong helmet. It looks awesome, uh, and it's 
quite a lot different in use, as you can see, uh, by a bunch of shots here that I've just taken of the helmet um, with myself wearing it, kind of selfies. Uh, as you can see, it looks quite aggressive. There's loads of vents. I can tell you they work extremely well. On the inside is probably what you want to know about. Now, it's got MIPS system in here, but different to what you're probably expecting from MIPS. Now, MIPS, no doubt, the multi-directional impact protection system uh, is a great thing to have because it's protection or prevention against uh, rotational injuries you can get from those oblique sort of impacts. Now, the thing with some MIPS systems in the past, they've involved having some kind of like web cage sort of thing that goes inside the helmet, takes up a bit of room in the helmet or they have to make the helmet bigger to accommodate that. Now this one, look at that. You can't see anything there. It's almost invisible. So you have these shearing style pads are made of a material that slides against each other. And then the pad itself sits. I'm not sure if you can see this, but on the inside it has a very like slick, shiny surface. So the pads Velcro or hook and loop in place, but they can still slide around loads. And actually the helmet can rotate quite an amount if it needs to in an impact. But really, other than that, you wouldn't even know it's there. Uh, what a cool system to have on the inside of a helmet. I'm just going to throw up a bunch more images on screen um, and read out anything else you need to know about it. Yep, so you've got that low friction layer on the inside, the MIPS Integra system. Like I said, it's available with the MIPS as the Quartal Race MIPS and as the regular Quartal without. Uh, the MIPS top end version is 250 euros and the regular version is 200 euros. It looks banging to me. Now there's a few hidden pieces of tech inside the helmet as well. So we have actually made a video dedicated about the tech in POC helmets previously. There's gonna be a link to that. In fact, you might see a little clip flashing up on screen of me in a very nice tactile helmet. Anyhow, it has the Reco reflector system built in. So that means mountain rescue can find you using reflector technology, uh, depending on where you're, you might be unlucky enough to end up need finding. Um, they will find you using this, whether it's with a helicopter with the RECO system mounted or mountain rescue that come to you. Now it's also got something very cool, as you might have noticed by this little sign here. It's got the NFC medical ID chip built into it. So this is a chip kind of, I guess, similar to explain, like a SIM card. Uh, it's on the inside, doesn't need batteries, and it's just there inside the helmet, it's free, and it works with a free app that you can download uh, called Twice Me. Um, it's standing for, like, in case of emergency. Essentially, you can put all of your medical details into the app and scan it into the chip on your helmet. So you have your uh, next of kin, blood type, allergies, passport number, anything crazy, uh, the medical services or a first responder needs to know. And basically, they can find out and they can help you if you're unable to speak, maybe if you're unconscious or something like that. A really cool system. Um, and I think it's really worth looking into, especially if you're planning on going on holiday in the big mountains, uh, or if you like to ride and just get out there in the hills. Um, NFC stuff, brilliant technology. Now to add on to that, as you might have noticed in all of these images firing up on screen, especially this one that shows off these uh, mirrored glasses. Uh, yeah, there's a new set of eyewear from Pop to go with them. <laughs> look at those bad boys. Yeah, obviously they look terrible on me like this, but in situ on your bike, they're incredible. Now you might notice they've got a massive lens on them. Like these are called a Devour, by the way. Huge lens. This one's a clarity lens, which I've talked about before. Essentially in the shadows, it enhances browns and greens, so you can really see um, shadows effectively. Uh, really good stuff, especially for us in the UK where it's not that sunny and tend to have dappled light when we get it. Now the lens is changeable on here, and you've got the frame, which has a couple of really cool features. So the ear stems themselves can be adjusted in length to suit different shaped faces. And the same with the nose piece as well. You can adjust that into multiple positions there to suit different shaped noses, uh, which is great when you've got a hooter like mine because it can be quite difficult to get set glasses to sit in the right place. They sit really far away from your face as well. Now, you might think that's a bit strange, but you can't see daylight out the bottom because of the size of the glasses, so you, you're not aware they're sitting away. But the time you are aware of it is when they don't mist up. Yes, at last. Glasses that don't mist up, something I suffer from massively because it's never really that cold here. In winter, it gets wet and steamy, all the rest of it. So that is a cool set of glasses. Now, the goggle style lens is absolutely colossal. So this may not suit some people with smaller heads, but I can tell you the sheer size of it is phenomenal for coverage. Really good. There's no sort of spots where you're looking through a frame or anything like that and you're having to make up your peripheral vision as such. Like, really, really cool stuff. Uh, what did you need to know about the glasses? So these retail, they're quite expensive. They retail for 250 euros, okay? Uh, there's a Carl Zeiss lens technology in those. And actually, I've said everything else, but they have got an anti-scratch and hydrophobic coating on them. Uh, it's called Repel, the hydrophobic and oleophobic protection. 
of course, interchangeable lenses, loads of different frame colors available, and they're designed to work basically seamlessly with their helmet, so you can put them in the, in the garage on the back there, slot straight in, no problem. And of course, they look pretty cool when you're running them with the helmet as well. Uh, it's really cool stuff. What do you think of Pop? You like them? Okay, next up in news is Saracen Bikes have gone direct and they've launched some amazing new bikes. Uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about the Aerial. So for a long time now, this has been their, their all mountain bike, their trail bike. Now they've got a few different options available. So you're gonna start seeing some images come up on screen now. So I wanna talk a little bit about the 30, the 60 and the 80. Now, first up, this is the Aerial 80 on screen. Now there's four sizes from small through to extra large. Now here is the first cool thing. The sizing, okay. Now, we've seen geometry progressing on many brands out there, and these guys are really pushing it right now. So, the reach on the small, 455. Reach on the medium, 480, yeah. So that's normally like a large, or even an extra large in certain brands. The extra large, 505, sorry, the large, 505, and the extra large, 530. That's getting into pole territory there, so that is really cool to see. Lots of options of size in there, obviously all based on the length of the bike. Um, wheel travel is 130 mil on the 30, uh, it's 160 mil on the 60, and 180 mil on the 80, okay? And on the small and medium in the 30, it comes in a mullet configuration, so 27 and a half on the rear and 29 on, on the front. In the large and extra large, it comes with 29, but it also comes with the link enabling you to basically, if you're running the 29s, you can run a 27 and a half mullet on the back. And if you're running the smaller medium, you could also run a 29. So the option's there if you want to do it, but they're trying to set the bike up as they see the best option for you. Now, uh, Super Boost out back, it's got 65 degree head angle, uh, 440 wheel chain stays, and it just looks great. Really, really nice looking bike. Uh, next up is the 60, okay? So same configuration, uh, same four sizes, same reach, 455, 480, 505, and 530 mil. Man, that's a long bike. Really, really long. Uh, 160 mil travel, 65 degree head angle, 76 and a half degree seat angle on there, 440 chain stays, 157 super boost um, on, the, on the back end there. And then there's the 80. Okay, so the same configurations on the 60 as the 30. So uh, small and medium, mullet style, uh, large and extra large 29, but they come with the chip, which enabling either of them to run either size rear wheel. So uh, way to go, Saracen. That's really cool. Great design work from the team there. Now there's the 80. Now, it's bigger travel, 180 mil. Uh, this is it on screen. And it runs on 27 and a half inch wheels. So this bike, some people might say it's a fun bike. It's just a business bike. If you want to just smash this thing around, this is probably what you're going to want to be looking at. Okay, so 27 and a half inch wheels, 63 and a half degree head angle, 75.8 degree seat angle on there, 438 mil back end, a little bit more playful, slightly smaller wheels, mind. Uh, 157 mil uh, super boost rear end on there, nice and big out back there. And then there's the Aerial Junior. Yeah. Check this out. So uh, from riders, they say 125 to 145 centimeters or thereabouts. Uh, reach is 360 mil, quite cute, isn't it? Um, travel, 120 mil, 24 inch wheels on there, 65 degree head angle um, and 385 on the chain stays there. Um, so wicked, wicked little bike. Man, how cool are kids bikes getting? I'm, I'm stoked for Dustin to get his first bike. Uh, because there's just so much choice out there now. Uh, no more hand-me-down stuff that's just going to be obscure old, old. I've got two older sisters, so I had like shopping bikes, all sorts of rubbish when I was growing up. So uh, Dustin's going to have something decent. Maybe he'll get an Aerial Junior. Who knows? But uh, really cool stuff from Saracen. And Saracen Bikes, their website is on screen right now, and you can buy direct from them. Um, again, urge you to check the range out. Very progressive brand at the moment, making some really good stuff, great price points on there, lots of different build options of their bikes, uh, and obviously lots of different choice in their bikes as well. Uh, great stuff in Saracen. Okay, next up in news, it isn't a product as such, but a bit of news from SRAM. They have acquired the Time Group. Now, who are Time, I think some of you might be asking. Um, well, Time make really, really good clip-in pedals. Now, unfortunately, they tend to fly under the radar a little bit, you know, because most people will be using Shimano out there or using Crank Brothers just because they're such long surf pedals. But Time has been around for a long, long, long time. Um, and in fact, in recent videos, Finn at Full Factory Suspension, he was telling me he's always around Time. He's tried every type of pedal and that is what he settled on. I think this is a really good acquisition for SRAM because firstly, the Time pedals are great quality, but they're just not out there as such. SRAM can really do this with that brand. And also, 
I can do some more with that because they haven't got a pedal brand in their portfolio as such. Now, I think a SRAM is like an umbrella brand, okay? So within it, you've got RockShots, you've got Trivative, uh, Zip, Quark, and now time is very fitting. Think of the OEM package that they can offer to bike brands wanting to spec something that's not Shimano or not Fox, for example. They can offer really good stuff and it feels like bespoke components as well because they've really hand selected what they wanted to pick. Uh, I think it's a great move for SRAM. I think it's a very fitting brand because of the fact that, well, obviously RockShox is biased towards mountain bikes. SRAM does road as well as off-road. Um, Quark obviously does stuff for both zip have done high-end road wheels for, for decades, and now they're doing those high-end moto, three, three moto uh, mountain bike wheels with those ankle flex in them. So Time is a great brand to reflect exactly where SRAM are. I think it's really cool. Uh, and if you didn't think Time is big enough, I'll just give you just three major names that have ridden and won significant races on the stuff. So Miguel Indurain, uh, the Spanish guy with a just an incredible history in road cycling. Uh, Greg LeMond, should I even need to say anything about Greg LeMond? And in the mountain bike world, Julian Absalom. He's been riding time for many years. So uh, I think that's a really cool brand. And watch this space, because I reckon there could be some cool developments coming from SRAM with time. Interesting stuff. Oh, speaking of SRAM, not necessarily SRAM related, but the UDH, which is the Universal Derailleur Hanger. Um, Rob from Newt Proof just fired me over a couple just to show you because of the fact that it's such a great bit of kit. Designed to be bashed out of harm's way and easily replaced if you damage them. Um, a single derailleur hanger to fit your bike. Uh, this one doesn't fit my reactor though, so it's not that useful for me, but I'll perhaps give these to Blake because he's got a mega and they fit on there. Uh, but great stuff that they're, they're stocking those as a spare part and there's a lot of places that stock them, which means a lot of people can get those mech hangers if they need them. Great stuff. And finally in news, uh, totally not tech related as well, just something that is cool AF. Yeah, the uh, Adidas Velo Samba shoe. This is it on screen. I thought this was a bit of a joke when I saw this on Instagram. I thought, oh yeah, someone's just mocked up an SPD style sole on the bottom, but no, you can buy them. I think 105 quid in the UK. Um, I just get directed because of uh, geocaching and stuff to the UK site. So I guess you can get these in Europe and probably in the States as well. <laughs> they just look mega. They look so good and I'd love a pair of something like this just to wear as a daily shoe, just to ride to the studio and back and for daily use. A pair of trainers with an SPD sole on. Brilliant, like why has no one done this properly before? They look awesome. Um, problem is, they're Adidas. And I do like the brand, I'm just not an Adidas person. I think you are or you're not, aren't you? And I'm sure loads of you are probably wanting to slag me off for that, but I, I really like my Vans, I'm a van sucker. So come on Vans. Okay, so let's dive into comments from last week's show. And this was talking mainly about some of the cool little small things, small details on your bikes. Um, maybe something you've put on there or something that's just already on there. I think I've referenced um, the chips on my reactor, the stem spacers on the canyon, and just a bunch of other stuff. I think the quick release skewer on the back of the Lux as well. It's just some cool stuff that just goes under the radar, I think it's worth shouting about. Uh, so Sam B 23 says, I love the storage compartment on my Trek. Uh, my dad's got Trek fuel and I've got the Calibre Sentry. It's a cracking um, open a bag of uh, Haribos without taking up, um, yeah, basically wants to poor Haribos in there, brilliant way of doing that. Uh, ben Boost, uh, loving the show. My favorite details are the Intend Smarty and the Bike Yoke Shifty, speaking about a shifting precision, and the Willy. Yeah, I know the Willy, so that's a little thing to stop stuff going down in your seat tube, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's really cool stuff. Yeah, and they do go unrecognized, I guess, although they're specific components, but they are still very cool, anyway. Um, Sebastian says, I really like the dirt shields that propane uses on their bikes. Yes, I've referenced this loads of time. Um, uh, hopefully there's a shot on screen of those dirt shields because we've referenced propane quite a lot recently it shows wicked idea an extra barrier over the bearings again it's not going to prevent you know loads of stuff getting in there but every little helps and if you ride in crap weather that is an awesome idea yeah nice one propane uh, Jamie G24 my Lightfield has an interesting design feature regarding a mech hanger. Instead of the hanger being the engineered weak point, the mounting bolt is the weak point instead. So in case worse happens, uh, there's a spare bolt on the chainstay that can be used. Yes, that is the Sintase X12 system. Um, I made a video about a really early 29, I think from 2011 or something, uh, my Norco Shinobi. Uh, that's it on screen, and that's gonna be in a link in the description underneath. That bike uses that exact system made by Sinte. So uh, this was an old one which had a 142 mil axle, yours might be 148 uh, or 142. And yeah, it stores, it's a chain ring bolt essentially that they use to hold it on. It's designed to shear deliberately because it's made of lightweight alloy. And the bolt itself even has a three mil bore on the inside. So when you do shear the head off, protecting your derailleur from breaking, 
you can just back it out with your Allen key, get the other one off the chainstay and fit it onto your bike. What a great idea, brilliant stuff. Um, yeah, so I think, I'm pretty sure that's what it, it might be called a different name on your bike, but it's, X12 was the system that they uh, enabled other companies to license and use. Um, KOS Films, you should build up a downcountry bike on the show, maybe a hardtail with the Lefty Archo 120. Uh, possibly the Yeti, oh God, any excuse to build a Yeti, everyone knows how I feel about those. Uh, and yeah, I, I, you know my feelings about Lefty as well, yeah, nail on the head there. Um, interestingly, I noticed the down country comment in, in the comments section was getting a bit of abuse from people. Look, if I say it, it's tongue in cheek, right, it's not really a bike category. There's cross country, there's trail, yeah, and it's kind of just like a cross country bike with a bigger fork and maybe some heavier tires. Um, it's, you know, it's a bit of a thing that the industry has jumped on but it will start to be more of a thing, actually. Now, we'll get to that. Um, Tyler Wrestler says, the lock-on SRAM Duralius. Yeah, 100%. That's an awesome thing that's always there. Uh, so Shimano Mechs don't have that. If you've got one of those, you've got the lever to turn the clutch off, which kind of achieves a similar thing. But I've got to say, SRAM has done it much better with the lock. Put the lock in, move the hanger, basically, and it's a pin that goes behind your uh, lower cage to keep it just completely slack. Brilliant system. Uh, yeah, hats off to SRAM for that one. Uh, Postmaster Sodium. Uh, my favorite hidden features are really hidden. I love the engineering that goes into manufacturing hardtails, allowing the right flex and stiffness where you want it. Very rarely thought about, but so important. Well, you say that, but actually that's kind of the same with a lot of bikes, and I think you're completely right. That is hidden, hidden stuff that's in bikes. I'll give you a good example of this. So I've got some really good contacts at Mondraker, and when they bought out their June frame, which is their carbon enduro frame, I forget the number, but it was something like they had at one point 10 different layups of the front end. So to make 10 front triangles, yeah, um, I don't know what size they would have made them all the same size, I'm sure, and put different back ends on them. 10 carbon fibre moulded frames. Carbon moulds cost like a serious money because the time, the effort, the casting to make the mould itself, and they had 10 of them, all with different layups. Because making a carbon Endura frame can be incredibly hard. Because if you make it too stiff, it becomes a nightmare to hold on to. And actually, as well as you may, might make the rear suspension, if the frame's too stiff, it's gonna almost deflect off things. You need an element of flex, but it's gotta be in the right place. You need flex around the bottom bracket, but not too much that the thing bends around in cornering. You need a bit of flex up by the head tube so you can hold onto the bike, but again, not so much that you get a horrible ride at the front end. So they had 10, I think, of this layup. Um, and if Israel, if you're watching this, you'll, you'll be able to confirm this or, or correct me like you normally do. But essentially they did a, a test session, I think it might be a Valda Solo somewhere, with a load of team riders, blind testing. They didn't tell them the difference and they wouldn't have known. They just had to write down feedback on each of the frames and they correlated that against stuff they got from telemetry and from actually cab design and stuff. So really cool. And yeah, you will get elements of this with all sorts of different frame manufacturing. People do different sorts of thought process to get to this sort of stuff. But yeah, you're right, like hidden stuff on bikes is actually the design. We all take it for granted, I think. I know I do because bikes are pretty friggin' awesome, aren't they? Quiz time, okay. I'm gonna ask you three questions and you're gonna try and answer those questions. <laughs> Would be questions, wouldn't they? Right, first one. Talked about POC in news earlier on. But what does POC stand for? Next one. What brand was SRAM Brakes previously known as? And the last one, what was special about Cannondale's early mountain bike tubing? Pick up the answers in a little while. Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. This is all about the place where you keep your bike, where you tuck it up at night, or maybe you just have a beer and like to look at your bike. And uh, imagine riding it if it's raining outside. Yeah, so if you've got a cool bike cave, or if you've got a tiny bike cave, or if you've got a bike cave you need to change and make cool, um, show us some pictures of it. Tell us what you're gonna do, tell us what you've done, um, and send it in. The link is right there. A better one is in the description underneath that you can click on, and it'll take you through to our uploader. What you need to do is upload some photos and tell us your name, where you're from, what bikes you've got, what you love, and what's in your bike cave, more importantly. Um, right, so first one this week is from uh, Waterford in Ireland. And so, right, we've got Planet X Road Bike and Uno Aura, uh, Rocky Mountain Slayer. Just converted my room into a bike cave. I've only got two bikes in it because I'm running low on space. I've got my Uno Aura at the bottom, which is just a masterpiece of design, I've got to say. Um, and my Planet X um, PCSI road bike up high. I have all my gear here 
and a lot of spare parts and accessories. All right, so obviously, I guess the Planet X road bike's a necessity, yeah, so let's just not talk about the elephant in the room. All right, let's talk about the mountain bike and the cool stuff, yeah? Just kidding. All right, it's a nice bike. But here we go, there's the business bike down the bottom there. I'll tell you what, I'd, I've never ridden one of the Uno bikes. I would love to. I think they're some of the most beautiful bikes money can buy. Absolutely lovely things. In fact, I must go and see them. I think they're based down near Barcelona. Uh, it'd be really cool. So they've got, as well as the in-house design facility, they actually make them there as well. They wanted to control every element of the carbon uh, carbon manufacturing process, so they do it in-house. Yeah, that's super cool. So I really want to try and go and see them at some point. That's Cesar Rojo and his amazing team. Beautiful looking bike. Um, Whoa, what's that old Rocky Mountain jersey? That's cool as. Nice. So all the old school logos on there, Honey, Stinger, Crank Brothers, Bell, Maxis. Rad, yeah, liking that. And cool Red Bull sign on the wall. Got your full face helmet, your Alpine Stars armor. Yes, this is starting to look very cool, mate. Love it. Good color walls as well. Nice bold color there to go with. Is that like a, have you got like a shop dummy in there with your body armor and stuff on it as well? Maybe I've not got there. Old school Pedro's jersey, that one's awesome. Yeah, that's well cool. Nice, I love all your little spotlighting that you've done under your shelves as well, of all your bike stuff on there. It's starting to look a bit more like a bike shop in there, I've got to say. Uh, not a bad thing, looks really cool. Yeah, loads of FSAs and Lifeline disc rotors. So you've got a pair of Oakley glasses, very nice. Spent no expense. Yeah, Oakley glasses, the Crank Brothers, the Uno. High roller, very nice. Yeah, lovely, so you've got some Cobalt stuff on there as well. Race face, loads of it. Awesome stuff there. Thank you for sending that one in. Uh, next one's from Warsaw in Indiana. Wow, okay, so uh, this is from a guy called Travis, and Travis likes track, apparently. Uh, I've just moved house and didn't have a garage. Next best thing is the basement, so I use the old cabinet to shore extra backup parts, and I set up a rack to store my kit. Even hung my 90s era Trek Shop window sign. All right, so that's a, uh, oh, nice. There's a sign, yeah, that looks rad. Okay, cool, right, now I get the look. Right, so you've got the bare concrete. That is cool. Massive TV. Flipping out, what's that? 65 or something. Um, nice, cool rug there. I like all your stuff with your uh, like your bike wardrobe there. Open and exposed. Yeah, it's looking awesome. I reckon uh, if you haven't got one already, you need a sofa in there. Everyone needs a sofa in a bike. I haven't got a sofa in a bike. I haven't fit one in there, but um, um, I'm sat on a part of the stool. I guess that's kind of right, isn't it? And there's your tool board. Love the little wardrobe in the corner. There's something cool about that bare concrete. Yeah, it looks really good. Nice compressor. You've got everything, actually. It looks like you've not got that much, I guess because it's all spaced out. But uh, yeah, it looks, looks really good. <laughs> awesome stuff. Thank you very much. Right, out of Bike Cave and onwards to get some more quiz answers, I think. And I say quiz answers, but I'm completely going off script here because we're going to go into Rewind. Actually, we haven't done a Rewind for a while. Um, in fact, I'm not going to show you anything that belongs to you guys because I just wanted to give a massive shout out to VintageCannondale.com. Uh, this is the website on screen. It's just an amazing archive of all old Cannondale catalogues. And there's some seriously cool stuff in here. Uh, definitely spend a bit of time, have a look through some of these old catalogues. They're pretty much all on there. Right, so did you know Cannondale actually started by making bags? They made pannier bags, hiking bags, so there should be some shots on screen just of some of the stuff on the site, but I urge you to go through and have a look on there because it's such a great resource. Now, when I speak to Cannondale and a UK importer of Cannondale called the Cycling Sports Group, they always recommend me to go to, to vintagecannondale.com uh, if I want to know anything old out. It's all on there. Right, so a few cool things, right? So backpacks, camping gear, you can see on screen. Um, so ahead of their time. Um, making all this stuff now, you know, then, and it's ironic that we're at the time now where everyone wants to do bike packing and camping and all those sorts of things now. Now, they also experimented with the mullet stuff way, way back before anyone else was doing it. So you're talking like mid 80s, in fact, early 80s, 1984 with your SM 400 and 500. So on screen right now, 24 inch rear wheel, 26 inch front wheel. I had a series of these. I think they did them for three or four years. Uh, so there should be a 1985 version, the yellow one. That, so that was a really iconic one. Man, I would love one of those. There's something about old Cannondales and I love the simplicity in that. 24 inch rear wheel, 26 front, I bet it felt horrible, but uh, who cares, look at it. Lovely looking bike. Now they also made this super cool kids trailer called the Bugger. 
Yeah, so they did the bugger one, bugger two, bugger three, and bugger four. I think this yellow one is the bugger four. So you could use it for kids, you could use it for cargo. There's various accessories you could have to go with it. And I mean, I still really want one. I want a bugger four like this one, the yellow one. Um, even if it's to put a barbecue and a load of beers in it. Like, it looks cool when it's a trailer for a bike. That's not a cool thing. And they made a really cool one. Uh, what else? Well, Canada actually famously gave us oversized tubing. So they, they used aluminium from the beginning, but to use aluminium on a mountain bike to make it light enough and stiff enough, it was just really impossible to do. So they oversized the tubing, so the walls of the tubing would be really thin and the tubing would be really big, basically. So you'd get the stiffness, but you the low weight, and you'd get really nice ride quality. Some alloy frames were incredibly harsh to ride, but Canada managed to absorb some of that impact with those large sized tubes. And also the welding of them, was famously beautiful. Obviously, Cannondale is still a lovely brand doing loads of cool progressive stuff these days, but let's not forget that they've done loads of firsts. So there were other designers doing this sort of stuff like Gary Klein with the amazing Adroit and Attitude bikes, but Cannondale is a mass market brand. They really showed us the way with oversized aluminium and man, their bikes were seriously sexy. So they were super cool. Then they gave us the Super V, the Killer V and the Delta V. Hopefully there's a Super V 900 on screen, which is still one of my favorite looking bikes of all time. Oh, just look at it, so simple, simple cantilever, um, low-ish pivot on there, so probably would have pedaled all right. Head shock design on the, on the front there. Look at it, it just looks so nice, so cool. And then there's the Delta V and the Killer Vs as well. Um, and then not to mention the Lefty, the Fatty, the Head shock, the Raven. Uh, do you remember the Raven? crazy bikes, it kind of had like an alloy exoskeleton with a carbon wrap, crazy piece of design. Cannondale have done loads and Vintage Cannondale is the site to go and read up on it. Get on there, a massive shout out to you guys. Okay, now it's time for quiz answers, okay? So the first question, I said, what does POC stand for? Did anyone get this? Piece of cake. Yeah, I even raised an eyebrow at that when I first heard it. But apparently, uh, there's a, well, there's a few variations to the story, but apparently the one I heard was the direction the company wanted to go. They saw it as a simple option. They were like, well, it's simple, it's a piece of cake. This is what we need to do. We need to make the ultimate protection gear. It's gonna be functional, but cool, and it's gonna serve for the purpose it needs to. So that's basically the direction they went. It's kind of cool, actually. That's what it says on the tin, I guess. Uh, next up was what, what brand was SRAM brakes previously known by? I'm sure some of you've got them on the bikes. So I've got some somewhere. Yeah, Avid. The Avid Juicy, one of the most famous brakes of all time. Uh, it's famously good when they worked, but you could get some dodgy ones here and there. Uh, but now they're SRAM brakes, so everything's changed. And what was so special about Cannondale's early mountain bike tubing? Yeah, it was oversized, so I just told you a bit about that. Uh, again, here's some shots from vintagecannondale.com on their website, just a bit of screen flow. Um, go and check out the site, it's seriously cool. Um, and it's some great nostalgic stuff. And in fact, in the rewind slot, I wanna refer you to some more cool brands out there because Rocky Mountain have got a great archive. In fact, I'll talk about Rocky Mountain next week because there's some cool stuff to go along with that. And there's gonna be a few more of these stories coming because let's face it, there's loads of cool brands out there that need a bit of love, I think. So uh, way to go. Awesome stuff, Cannondale. And that's the end of this week's show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, let us know what you think in those comments and we'll see you next week. See you later.